I've taken the stuff that Robert Rafferty has produced uh, and I'll, I'll take some of the material from Robert Rafferty's and plus some of the uh, other stuff. Bobby McLean, uh, which is the son of Robert, uh, hung around the sheriff's office quite a bit and was able to get some of the stories from, uh, from Bobby too. Robert McLean was born in Mandan, North Dakota uh, and his family moved to Missoula and Robert McLean has one of the histories that is very common among all the, all, quite a few of the sheriffs in Montana. He worked for the Northern Pacific Railroad. Uh, as you start to research him, you'll see a lot of them working for the Northern Pacific Railroad. Uh, he was also a deputy and an undersheriff for Sheriff James Thompson, who's also buried over in another section of the cemetery. Uh, in 1941, let me see if I got this. 1941, while he was the undersheriff for James Thompson, they had a shooting over in the Rattlesnake. And this is the first documented case of a postal worker going postal in Missoula. Okay, okay, I made that up. But anyway, the guy was a postal worker uh, at Missoula, and there was the shooting. And one of the deputies, Lloyd Stinger, was actually shot and killed uh, by this postal worker. Uh, and then there was an ensuing shootout. And during the shootout, uh, the suspect, I don't remember his name, he was either, he was shot by Robert McLean, captured, and according to Terry Cook yesterday, uh, he was actually tried and sent to prison and spent a lengthy term there in prison. The other notable thing on Sheriff McLean was he was the last sheriff to legally hang anyone in the state of Montana. And the person he hanged was Philip Slim Coleman. Slim Coleman had kind of a unique history in that uh, he went out to Lothrop into the area and applied for a job and the Pearsons gave him a job on the section crew. They decided they wanted to come to town and do some gambling and stuff. So uh, they needed some money and transportation so they went to the Coleman house or to the Pearson house, knocked on the door, it came out. Slim Coleman said he had a headache uh, along with this Lewis Brown who was with him. And uh, when he came out, Philip Coleman hit him over the head, knocked him out, killed him, went into the house, and then also killed Mrs. Pearson. Uh, there was a daughter in the house and a son that weren't harmed, but they stole the money, took the car, and they came down to Missoula. The Brown didn't particularly want to be associated with Coleman because he was too violent, so he took off on foot, went down the tracks, was able to jump the train and get into Missoula. Coleman got to Missoula, decided it wasn't a friendly place, and hopped the train and made it to Drummond where he's apprehended. Uh, once he was apprehended there, he came back and they asked him, why didn't you keep going? He says, well, I could have made it to Mississippi and went into the mountains, but you would have never, never caught me there. And here I am. Philip Coleman also said that, uh, well, let's just put it this way. He wasn't a nice guy. Sheriff McLean took a tape statement from him and uh, he, he confessed to, I think, 25, 27 murders. Uh, a couple of them in Washington, some back in D.C. Uh, somewhere along the way, Marsha, the transcript or the stenographer's notes uh, were lost and no one can ever can find those particular information on that confession. Robert McLean also was involved in some other interesting investigations uh, besides the Coleman. I gotta find it. Uh, he was written up in the newspaper or uh, 
back in the 40s and early 50s, they had the detective magazines and those were the big thrill. And Sheriff McLean had several stories within that. One was a bank robbery which occurred down in Victor and the people came back up into Missoula. Uh, they were Missoula residents that drove down to Victor in River Valley County, committed the robbery and came back, which is a common problem we're still having. Criminals travel. Uh, they don't re respect the state or county boundary lines. Um, the gallows that was used to hang Phil, uh, Philip Slim Coleman uh, was specially built uh, for that execution only. They built it at the old Missoula County Jail, which is roughly where the parking lot is now at the courthouse. Uh, it was a brick building when it was built in 1889, I believe. It cost $18,900. Uh, and that's where uh, the execution came. They, built it over the stairwell, stairwell or stairs, and then he was hung. There was gonna be an execution in Toole County. Uh, it was, the gallows were transferred over to Toole County. Uh, that guy got off, or he didn't get off. He got a reprieve uh, and a long prison term, and then he came back. The gallows were shipped back, and they ended up in the county uh, fairgrounds for a long time, and they don't know how they got there or, or who put them there, but that's where they found them, and now the gallows are uh, the property of the Historical Society. If you want to see them, I don't know how you're going to do it. <laughs> uh, in the book here that uh, was produced, they mention that the gallows that were found at the fairgrounds were the gallows that Sheriff Sam Houston used, and that was the one that was used to hang uh, four Indians at one time. I haven't seen the gallows, so I don't know which one they are. It's one of the, it's either one of them. I don't know which one for sure. Any questions on Sheriff McLean? Let's move on to Mr. Cole. Before I start this one, how many of you guys have heard the term, jerk him to Jesus? Michael Moore, anybody else? I, I'm gonna give you my version of where I, where I think that term came from here in a little bit. Uh, sheriff George A. Cole was the 30th sheriff in Missoula County. His term was from started in 1921. He had the distinction of replacing Sheriff William Houston after he got kicked out of office for uh, moonshining. He was finding he was finding a unique way to supply or support the sheriff's office budget. Uh, I'll get into him a little later. Uh, George Cole. Uh, was 75 when he passed away here uh, and one of he had a couple of important things on his history one he uh, right after he became sheriff uh, he got information that some people four people from Butte were coming over to Missoula with some moonshine now I don't know how this would have happened in Butte Montana where there was making moonshine during prohibition I just I find that hard to believe uh, anyway they got tipped off and uh, they went to a house and uh, they found J.C. Gilman and G.F. Coleman, who officials said had a small quantity of moonshine and a six-shooter, ready for business in the car they were riding in. The car, the sheriff says, will be, confisc or, well, will be confiscated and the men are in the county jails. Then they went to the Mercer house uh, where the landlady, Eva White, officials claimed had rented a room to Jack Reynolds and was arrested for liquor possession. The officials claimed they found 40 gallons of moonshine in his room. Uh, the description they had of this moonshine, according to the Missoulian, uh, it was of the poorest grade moon, has an awful wallop. The sheriff's forces uh, were wondering if the receipt found in the pocket of George W. or George F. Kennedy is the basis for the liquor Reynolds had in his room. And if anybody wants the recipe to build, to build moonshine, I will give it to you right now. Boil five gallons of water, 18 pounds of spuds, let cool. Add eight pounds of sugar and two yeast cakes. Distill inside of 24 hours as the bubbles will stop, as the bubbles will stop coming up. I'm sure they had it aged for about 28 seconds and then they're passing it off, drinking it. Uh, I haven't tried this recipe, so I don't know if it's any good, but probably it's not. Uh, Shortly after uh, George Cole became sheriff, he was also 
involved in the arrest of a Serbian by the name of Vukovic, Joe Vukovic. Joe Vukovic uh, was quite the ladies' man. He traveled around uh, the area. He was down in uh, Darby, Montana, where he had several several women, and uh, he was abusing them and beating them up, and the people in Darby, act Darby Montana, actually evicted him from town. Uh, he came back up to Missoula. He was still a womanizer, uh, still involved in, a, in abuse, and uh, he was well known to the local law enforcement. One night, uh, he's out wandering around in the street, uh, and he has his gun, and he shoots. I don't remember who he shot, but he shot somebody, and I can look it up in a second. Uh, he he shot uh, shot someone, and the witness to this, her husband actually was later on arrested for killing someone too. Uh, and he takes off, and he's. Uh, later apprehended over in the drum in Montana area. The way he escaped is he's up on a farm up the Blackfoot, he runs up over, the, not the Blackfoot, Grant Creek, he goes up over the top of Grant Creek into the Rattlesnake, down into Bonner, catches a train, and that's where he's apprehended. Uh, he was the last person to be legally hanged with the jerk type uh, gallows. And what the jerk type gallows was is they'd have the cross beams up in a couple of pulleys and a three or four hundred pound weight. They'd put the noose underneath them, they'd cut the rope, the weight would fall down, and it would jerk them up into the air, hopefully breaking their neck. And once they went up into the air, they'd come back down, and uh, if the first one didn't do it, uh, they hoped the drop coming back would do it. According to the coroner's inquest on this one, Joe Vukovic uh, was strangled to death. Uh, didn't break his neck. And that was kind of a rarity because the jerk type system, uh, most of them did have the, have the clean break on the neck. Uh, when he was apprehended, uh, Joe Vukovic confessed to the deputies that he had committed the crime. They never did find the weapon. After he got back to Missoula, uh, he claimed his innocence. And all the way up until the time he was executed, he claimed he was innocent. So, who knows? Jerk him to Jesus came from this jerk type gallows. When they dropped the weight, they jerk. He he would die, and they'd be jerking him to Jesus. <laughs>
tobacco and they'd have a real colorful language to entice the oxen to move forward. Uh, I wasn't alive in that era, so I don't know if they had the colorful language or not. Uh, he is well liked uh, in Missoula. He was elected sheriff, served continuously through 19, 1920, was out for a term, and then he served that last term. He was also employed by the Forest Service. One of the more interesting things uh, that happened during his term was uh, the Missoula County Jail, the one that was in the parking lot, which was the brick structure that was built in about 1889 for $18,900. Uh, it wasn't a very well-built jail. It must have been a low-bid contract thing or something. Uh, because the, yes, that was my sarcastic remark. Uh, because what happened is, is the, the inmates, 19 inmates, were able to break through the floor and they were tunneling out of the, out of the jail. Uh, they got through the jail, underneath the jail, and they were just about five to 15 minutes away from getting into the sewer pipes and then they'd have a free, free escape when they were discovered. There was a blind spot in the jail. Uh, that they was able to get behind. They used boards in their hands to dig this tunnel to get out of the jail. So when they brought that up to the county commissioners, they thought it was important that they fix the jail. Uh, another thing that they had listed within this era is the jail. When it was built, it had four, four pods that would hold eight prisoners for a total of 32 prisoners. They frequently mentioned that they had between 40 and 105 prisoners in the jail. Uh, so overcrowding, even back in the 1800s and 1900s, was an issue. Uh, and they uh, repaired the jail in the spring. The, male, the men were all, all locked into the cells and didn't have any freedom of access. And that's what happened on that. Now we'll move down to Sheriff Hayfron. This is the only sheriff in the cemetery of the 14 that does not have a marked uh, headstone. Uh, the Deputy Sheriff's Association is taking up uh, under advisement and they're going to see if they can purchase him a headstone so he'll at least have a marked grave. Uh, and for some odd reason, I left my material on Daniel Hoffron or Hayfron uh, at home. He uh, came from Ireland. He was hooked into the potato famine. He came over into Montana. Uh, he was with the Northern Pacific Railroad. We've heard this term in Milwaukee, Northern Pacific, all along here. It seemed to bring the people into Montana. Uh, he was a butcher in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Went over to Corinne, Utah. Uh, took the railroad up into Beaverhead County and worked into Beaverhead. And then finally ended up into Montana where he worked on the railroad. Was a butcher, did some logging. Uh, did anything for did anything for a buck basically. Uh, sheriff Hayfron uh, was a no 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 nonsense sheriff. If there was a problem, he went out and handled the problem. Uh, and he did such a good job of handling the problem that the crime rate in Montana, whoops, the crime rate in Missoula took a big dip. And once it took this big dip, uh, county commissioners are saying, well, wow, you've got a sheriff, the undersheriff, the deputy, and the jailer. They're not doing anything. Obviously, we've got too many of them, so we either got to lay people off or we got to reduce their salary because they're not doing enough work. Now, this makes a lot of sense. You're doing a good job, so, and you've stopped crime in Missoula, so how do you keep crime from coming back to Missoula? You lower everybody's salary by 35%. Okay. Uh, he still went out and he did the best he could. In this time period, Missoula County uh, encompassed all of western Montana. Uh, so, Continental Divide, down to Idaho, all the way up to the Canadian border was all Missoula County. Missoula County became a county in 1860. Sheriff Hayfron was in the 1870s, 1880s. Uh, so Missoula County was quite large. And one of the problems they had going on at that particular time was renegade Indians uh, from the reservation. Uh, some of the renegades, I've only got one side of the story, so it's gonna be slanted. 
please take this into consideration. <laughs> Uh, the renegade Indians uh, were claiming to have some grievances. I don't know what those grievances are. And they would take it out and they would raid, rob uh, the white men, sometimes killing them. Uh, they had four of them in particular, uh, Pascal, Antley, Lala C, and someone else. Uh, it's the one on Sheriff Houston's anyway when you get Pierre Paul. Uh, that were out there. Uh, Sheriff Hafron went up into the reservation to actually capture them. When he went to capture them, uh, he found a large group of Indians. One of the group of Indians uh, was the father of, of one of the guys that they were looking for. When he went to uh, capture them, this uh, chief or Indian uh, decided that he wasn't going to turn in his son. He pulled a gun and there was a shootout that ensued. And Sheriff Hayfron uh, killed this guy, and the investigation, uh, according to this book, says that this guy was also involved in the killing of several of the uh, Indians, or several of the white folks uh, up there. He tried to uh, capture him, and he was working with the agent, uh, Peter Onan, who was the tribal agent up on the reservation. Peter Onan said, yes, we need to get these guys arrested. He had 26 uh, Indian police officers, but he would not let the Indian police officers go out and attempt to apprehend these renegade Indians. Now, let's be fair about why Peter Onan probably didn't let him go out there and capture the renegade Indians. The renegade Indians had firearms. Uh, they had no they, they didn't care who they killed, they would kill uh, to get the money, alcohol or whatever. His, his tribal police officers had no firearms, had no access to firearms, and, he, and uh, Sheriff Afron said, hey, will you go help me get them? And Peter Onan says, no, I'm not going to get my officers out there killed. So he didn't do that. Peter Onan, uh, later on with Sheriff Bill Houston, uh, made a promise that after the Indians were hanged that he would actually ensure that they would get transported back to the reservation and uh, buried there, which he carried through on that promise. <laughs> Sheriff Houston was elected into the office in 1890. Uh, my other group uh, learned that Sher Sheriff Hafron uh, was involved in trying to trap down, trap down, track down four Indians, uh, renegade Indians who committed multiple murders here in Missoula County. Missoula County at that time was everything in western Montana. It went from the Continental Divide to Idaho, followed the Idaho border up all the way up to uh, Canada. That was Missoula County in 1890s. Uh, Rene renegade Indians came in and they had grievances with the the white settlers and they would go in and, and raid them and kill them. At, sometimes they had three and four at a time, sometimes they would kill two. Uh, there were four Indians, uh, La La C, Pierre, Pierre Paul, Antley, and who am I forgetting? Pascal. Uh, and uh, the Sheriff Hafron went up to capture him. He asked for the cooperation of the Indian tribes uh, and the Indian police. They didn't do it. Like I mentioned earlier, it's because the Indian police didn't have guns and the renegades had guns, so for some odd reason they didn't want to kill the police chasing down a bunch of renegades. Sheriff Houston said, hey, I'm going to be a law and order sheriff. I want to make sure that we capture these, these people here because it makes because we have a right to be safe in our homes and our property. He went up to the reservation and he found uh, the tribal chief of one group of the renegade Indians, and I don't remember the name. It's in the book, Susan, if you'll look it up, the name of the chief. Uh, anyway, they found him, and they started talking to him, and he came down that he wasn't going to cooperate with them. Now, depending on whose version you want to believe, Sheriff Houston then arrested the guy and took him out to Flathead Lake from the tribe and, and put him out in the boat and held him there until he would cooperate in the apprehension. The other version is he kidnapped him, took him out into the boat and, was gonna, and wouldn't let him go until after they produced the Indians. Uh, whose version you want to believe, we'll leave that up to you. Uh, but anyway, uh, 
one Indian by the name of Williams, who wasn't part of the stuff, was, was turned in at that time. And uh, two of the Indians, two of the four Indians were, were turned in at that, by the, by the tribe. Uh, and then they had a posse of about 60, 60 and 20 white folks up there looking for him. Uh, he told the Indian agents to round up all the tribal chiefs with these guys because he wanted to talk to them and the tribal police didn't cooperate with them or Peter Ronan. So uh, Bill Houston went up to the, all the tribal chiefs again and says, hey, you're all gonna be arrested and taken into jail and held until you produce these guys or you can produce the guys and we'll be friends. Oh, going back to the first chief, uh, for that chief's inconvenience out there in the middle of the lake that was kidnapped or arrested, Sheriff Houston actually gave him a pistol afterwards to, to re or compensate him for his inconvenience and they be became friends and remained friends till the very end. Uh, so he went up to the chiefs up there and said, hey, you're either going to produce them or not. They said, we're not going to. Another chief of police for the Indian police said, hey, let's have a quick talk here. They talked a little bit and the tribal council decided, well, maybe we better cooperate with Sheriff Houston because he's crazy enough to actually try to do what he said he's doing. Uh, they produced uh, one more of the Indians and then the Canadian Mounties uh, captured the fourth one. They came down to Missoula uh, where they had the trial. They were convicted. They had interpreters. Uh, in the book that Susan's holding, she can tell you who the who the jury was on each and every one of them. Uh, all four were convicted. They all had the same date of execution. There had never been a four, a gallows built for four in Montana before, but just as luck would have it, Chicago, Illinois, Cook County had a hanging about two months before this all happened, and they had the plans and sketches for a gallows that would hang four people because they hung four people also. Uh, so Sheriff Houston called that sheriff. He didn't call him because he didn't have telephony, teletype, or <laughs> he, he wrote him. There we go with the, uh, and that sheriff was very cooperative and uh, produced all the plans and everything else which uh, was used to build the gallows. According to the information that I've received, the gallow, uh, was had four hinges on it. The, the trap was seven feet wide, uh, four feet by four feet, and the trap was released uh, with the rope. When the rope was cut, the trap would, would release, and the Indian was, uh, or the deceased would fall. Uh, Sheriff Houston said that these particular Indians were very good uh, inmates, and uh, after the execution, he had kind of a different opinion on, on capital punishment. Uh, the next term that he came into was in about 1920, 1919, 1920, and uh, as he was elected, uh, he, ca he campaigned on a promise that he was also a police chief and ran the police department and reduced their budget by about a third, to th 33% to 50% is what he reduced the police budget. Uh, the budget when he was there uh, was $9,000 and him and his officers uh, turned in fines for $9,400, so the office actually made a profit uh, for, the sheriff, for the police department. So he was a very efficient, and he was campaigning on cutting cost uh, for the sheriff's department uh, because costs were getting out, outrageous. Uh, so he's working along, and it's prohibition, and he's cutting the cost of the sheriff's department, but he still has to pay the salaries and everything else. So. I'm making this up because this is what I believe happened, so don't quote me on this one, okay? I believe that Sheriff Houston has to find a way to supplement the income because the commissioners are taking him to task to reduce his budget. So moonshining's running along here, he starts running moonshine. He's supplementing the department's budget, uh, is what I believe happened. I have nothing to prove or back up any of this, so I'll run that out right now. Uh, county commissioners and the public kind of took offense to this, saying that was official misconduct, uh, and he was fired and voted out of office. The other thing, uh, another person in the first term that he had was a guy by the name of Burns, and in Missoula, uh, 
So he hung the four Indians, and the fourth person he hung, or the fifth person he hung, was Burns. Burns uh, was a transient. He was traveling with another transient. Uh, they were downtown Missoula, and they were selling stolen property at the pawn shops that was stolen from Spokane. Fire breaks out in Missoula, and the businessmen are are kind of more interested in putting out the or protecting their property and and putting the fire out so they're not paying particular attention and a lot of looting and, and other activities going on. Burns and his other transient are part of the looting and uh, a gold bloom confronts him. They get in a, a yelling match. Burns pulls a gun and he shoots uh, two rounds. Misses gold bloom but he hits Maurice Higgins. How many heard Higgins Avenue? Maurice is the son of one of the founders of Missoula. He's hit, he uh, goes to the sister's hospital, which turned into St. Pat's, and uh, he dies there the next day. Uh, Burns takes off, goes across the river, he's hiding. Uh, Sheriff Houston's on the bridge, he sees him, and he tracks him, and he gets over there, and Burns makes it back across the river. He comes back, and they come down into the downtown area, and Sheriff Houston gets up behind him and says, uh, stop. The guy turns around and Sheriff Houston's standing right there with the gun right at his nose. Uh, Burns decided not to resist any further. He went to jail. Uh, he is convicted of the crime, executed, uh, and according to the stories that we've heard, is somehow or another Burns' body wasn't taking care of property properly. Uh, the sheriff got him buried. Uh, they might have had grave, grave diggers, or he might have been to display at the funeral home. Anyway, uh, someone came out there and skinned him, and according to the story, turned his hide into shoes. Uh, and that's in a Missoulian article, and it's also in the book that Susan has. So there's also stories in Texas uh, where they actually have pictures of the books and stuff where outlaws were skinned and tanned, and so. I think it's kind of believable that, that it happened. Uh, a few days before Sheriff Houston died, April 15, 1937, he told an old friend, I made the greatest cleanup, well before I read this I'm going to back up one more. Sheriff Houston uh, also uh, traveled up through Cheyenne and, uh, and worked on the stagecoach and Wild Bill Hickok actually got him the job on the stagecoach running, go from Cheyenne up into Deadwood and stuff like that. Uh, Bill Houston made the claim and boasted that he actually pistol whipped Wild Bill Hickok. Uh, so he was, he was pretty good there. And uh, just before his death, this is the claim that Houston made. I made the greatest cleanup in the West has ever had. I hanged five men, shot one in the street, and sent more than 100 men over the road to the penitentiary for different crimes. Sheriff Bill Houston, probably one of our most colorful sheriffs. <laughs> any questions on Bill or any of the others? That's it. Very nice.